church. Can you hear me in the back? No? 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 Okay, well, we'll try and shout a bit. Make sure that uh, I'll try and do my best so that you can hear what's going on. You're doing well. Thank you very much, whoever said that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I, I type this because it would be otherwise. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's celebration of Neil Ryan's life. I'm Roger Taylor, and I'm honoured to be your MC for the next hour. Before starting the program, will you please give a very warm welcome to Liz Ryan and various generations of Neil's family, many of whom have travelled some considerable distance to be here tonight.
hear more about the savings of the laws and its role today, we will hand over to Wendy Stone and Dan T. Bowen. Wendy? vigilance and energy which Neil brought to the huge project which became Saving the Halls. And I was at a community opera event last year and I looked around at the audience and I thought probably very few of them would know about the history of the venue and what it went through. And to realise how lucky we all were to have had a champion in Neil who was with us when it mattered to preserve it. And I think we need to remind ourselves that it wasn't always so. In fact, most people had no idea what went on inside this building, although it had loomed large in the village. It was largely unknown and, and unloved. So when Neil was alerted to the threats to its future, it needed all his vision and his perseverance and his energy and his powers of persuasion, which we know he had in abundance, to engage people in the value of the projects which would take many years to come to fruition. And I think there were two key elements to making this happen. The most immediate challenge at the time was to secure the fabric of the building to prevent it coming down, whether that was through development and demolition to use the site. And almost as pressing a possibility of it falling down so precarious at the time was the fabric through dilapidation of the building. That was the first part. The second and arguably the more difficult one was making the whole area aware of the halls and why it was important as part of our history, but also part of our future. And while Neil was shouldering this burden, this burden his enthusiasm and his, his dogged determination engaged and inspired large numbers of local people who then brought their considerable resources and professional expertise to the project and who were galvanised into giving huge amounts of time and energy to support the preservation of the halls. And I don't know how many people at the time realised quite what was being undertaken. I personally, I remember Marks and Spencers at Lewisham had donated £30,000 to, um, to, to the fund. And, Neil was standing outside with the manager from the store with the photographer doing their, their PR bit. And I really remember Neil's expression, and I can only describe it as exuberant exasperation. <laughs> because he was grateful for the money, but he knew and he realised that in terms of fundraising, we had a mountain to climb, and frankly, we were just almost not even in the foothills, but we were really had a huge task ahead of us. And there, was, there were many, many challenges along the way. And some of them you'll see here, and significant ones like possibly losing promised funding. And then things that were minor but were important to some of us, the beautiful old canopy that has been outside the door, which didn't survive an encounter with a passing large van. But the project survived and it thrived. And as soon as this room was more or less safe for the public to use, events began. And for many years, this room was the halls. And it looked nothing like this, it was very rough and ready. Eventually, some curtains were donated by Sanderson's, which was a big thing at the time. But looking back at the Royal Corps of Artists who performed in this room, it's a list of who's who of illustrious names in the music world. People like Sir Willard White, Dame Emma Kirkby, Benjamin Luxon, Philip Langridge and Anne Murray, 
Sir Thomas Allen, Sarah Walker and Roger Vino, even George Bellin. There was a wonderful evening when Richard Rodney Bennett and Marion Montgomery did a cabaret style event here. And there were festivals by the Lindsay Quartet of Proof Coffee Season, led by Sir Redwood Downs. The list goes on. But these artists came because beautiful spaces draw people to them, and they all recognised what a special venue this was. Meanwhile, ballet classes were being held downstairs in the bar area for local wannabe ballerinas, and this room was used as a rehearsal space by Elijah Majinski when he was directing the Three Sisters at British Theatre. That was in those days when the British Theatre was functioning. And there was a fundraising forties night when I think quite a lot of people in this room would have been here, which offered us a serious dressing up opportunity. Eventually, the prospect of opening the main hall began, and that posed even greater challenges. There was a time when executives from EMI came down to assess the possibility of using it as a recording space. And they were astounded by the quality of the acoustic. If only we could fix the holes in the roof to stop the pigeons getting in. And so a whole new chapter of renovation began. And Nigel Kennedy in his punk phase was the inaugural concert in the halls. But at that time, it still had to be performed on the floor because the stage was still a work in progress. The rest, as they say these days, is history. Some of the original ideas for the use of the hall have been realised, and others, which we couldn't even imagine then, happen regularly and successfully now. So tonight we have this wonderful opportunity to recognise what an enormous legacy Neil has given this community in this building. Keeping the Blackheath Halls integrated into the village architecture, and above all, enabling this building to become a vibrant centre of activity within the community. And I'm now going to ask Anthony to explain what's going on now. Thank you very much. Well, I'm Anthony Van, and I have the pleasure and the privilege to be not only the principal of Trinity Lab and Conservative Art Music and Dance, but also the current chair of the board of Blackie Falls. On April 17th, on April the 17th of this year, is that okay? Can you hear me now? On April the 17th of this year, um, we were able to celebrate uh, the latest renovations of this hall, the multi million pound renovations of these halls which had begun in 2018. And we have to thank principally the Hearn Foundation, um, but many others for that work, the Friends of Blackheath Falls and many others. And as a result, we now operate um, about 1,000 events each year in the halls. We have Trinity Larvin students um, performing in all the various ways that they perform. We have a vibrant community program. We have the community opera, the community Choir, um, the whole range of community events, many ad hoc events we bring schools in, and we have a full professional art centre program. As I say, 1,000 events each year. It's a great sadness to me and my colleagues that when we did that celebration, Neil couldn't be with us because there's no doubt that without Neil's work and the work of others in the room tonight. None of that would have happened because the halls wouldn't be here. So our history of Trinity Larvin is that we moved from central London, just behind the Wigmore Hall in central London, as Trinity College of Music. We moved to the Honourable Naval College in 2001 and we were able to convert that into many different things. We have 92 practice rooms for our students. But what we didn't have was a large room for concerts and we have a symphony orchestra. So we were able to purchase the lease of Blackheath Halls. The Preservation Trust retained the freehold, 
until later in the time, I think when we were trusted, we obtained the freehold for it. But it was Neil's early work that really made this possible. And for him, we have major, major thanks. Um, when I was looking to speak to you this evening, and I'm not going to talk for very long, um, I went to our archive, because we hold the Black Eagles archive in the Jerwood Library at Trinity Larvin. And it's a remarkable archive because it is so meticulously put together. And I was delighted to see on the front page that the credit for putting the archive together in such a wonderful way is credited to Neil for his work as a brilliant historian, as well as a driver of the change for this wonderful value. So Trinity Larvin, thanks Neil, because without his work, we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't be doing these events in this wonderful hall. Thank you. Now we have uh, Julian on mic, may we? Uh, Julian Watson, who's going to talk us through Neil's work. Thank you, Robert. Searching the Greenwich Archives for his many books and articles, and there must be others which I've forgotten. For anyone in charge of archive collections, it is difficult to imagine a better visitor and researcher than Neil. He was very engaging, humorous, he knew exactly what he wanted, was very well organised, and worked extremely hard and quietly. When I first met him in the local history room at the old Blackheath Library in St John's Park, a former vicarage, he was fairly new to historical research, but took to it immediately. The library was allegedly haunted, and the braying of the parish donkey in the garden was a daily feature. <laughs> Neil, a journalist, had been commissioned by the Greater London Council to write a book celebrating the centenary of the takeover of the Heath. Um, yeah, sorry, takeover of the Heath by the Metropolitan Board of Works in 1871. The Heath was taken over to protect it from development and depredation. The book, based on the researches in Greenwich's archives and those of the Great London Council, was published in 1971. It was and is excellent, the product of fine research and writing, together with very good design and printing at the GLC. This was the first of the Blackheath Masterworks. That was our first meeting. There were to be many more encounters at the local history library and also collaborations, joint lectures, lectures at the National Maritime Museum, local history courses, local history festivals, Diana Rimmel's local history classes, the 1984 Greenwich Book Festival, in which Neil and I appeared with some very eminent writers. <coughs> All this over many decades. By 1970, the local history service had been transferred to Woodlands in Mycenae Road, a building that had been saved from demolition by the GLC. The local history service covered all of the new London Borough of Greenwich, so had to accommodate historical collections from the former borough of Woolwich. A lot of new space was needed. At about this time, Alan Roger Martin, a 
Hofstede, number six, Elliot Place, Blackheath, joint founder of the Blackheath Society and an eminent antiquary, was anxious to deposit his very large collection of local documents to the local history library prior to his move to Morgan College. Roger Martin was a quiet and sensitive man who needed to be dealt with sympathetically. He trusted Neil completely, acted on his advice, and developed a strong friendship with him. Without Neil, and also Greenwich's very fine, maybe the finest chief librarian, David Legger, the uh, collection may never have been deposited with Greenwich House. Neil was Martin's executor and trustee, and the transfer to Woodlands took place. Neil was a very frequent visitor to Woodlands as he worked on Volume 1 and Volume 2 of his Blackheath and Anubaran series. Later, there were the two editions of the Heath book and much more. His application and concentration as he worked his way through all the Greenwich books from the 1690s to the 20th century minute books, maps, enumerator census returns, directories, everything and anything, a formidable feat of concentration. It was all so impressive. So impressive that the staff willingly endured carrying extremely heavy documents from the archive store in the basement to a search room on the first floor with no lift. His visits resulted in great historical outcomes and discussions with staff and fellow users. A wonderful byproduct of his intensive research was the Blackheath Indexes, a vast database of names and addresses he had discovered in all of the sources that he had used and then entered in a remarkable series of page-a-day desk diaries, one page per uh, address, beautifully organised. This database was later digitised and shared. Neil would always share his research without hesitation, a great characteristic. Members of our two very fine historical societies Greenwich Historical Society and the Greenwich Industrial History Society will testify to that. He and I worked on many projects. One of the most productive was an international collaboration that led to a memorable meeting at Woodlands, resulting in Neil's fascinating lecture to the Greenwich Historical Society in 1991 on the shipping merchants of Blackheath and their connection to the transportation of convicts. Dan Burns, a historian from Australia, arrived with a list of names connected with transportation and the late Charles Campbell, director of prisons for the state of Alaska, came to find out more about the prison hulk system as he was writing his book, The Intolerable Hulks. Neil knew about the Blackheath merchants who were on Dan Burns' list, and I was able to provide material and sources on the Woolwich and Deptford Hulks. The end result? Dan Burns' website, The Blackheath Connection, which is still functioning, Charles Cannon's book, which was published, and Neil's lecture. Typescripts of Neil's Shipping Merchants lecture, Transportation and the Blackheath Connection exist, but it has never been published because Neil thought that more work was needed to be done. It's an important piece of work, fascinating and shady. It needs to be finished and 
published. There was a, an extended time of madness, started, I think, by Dan Farson and picked up by many others about Montague John Druitt of Elliot Place School on Blackheath as a prime suspect in the Jack the Ripper case. <laughs> Neil was deluged with pestering inquiries about this and it made him very cross. So he produced a definitive essay about the matter and eventually the poor, abused Montague John Druitt ceased to be a suspect and has been forgotten. Neil's Jack the Ripper paper is finished but has not yet been published. As the millennium approached, new high-tech schemes were in the air. Six South London boroughs, including Greenwich and Lewisham, collaborated to create a new website charting the history of our local communities. This marvelous project resulted in the Ideal Homes website, which had pictures, maps, short historical essays by local archivists and librarians, and much longer in-depth essays. Neil wrote a long essay about the Cater Estate for this project, and it is still on the website now operated by the University of Greenwich. The website looks its age, I'm afraid, but it is still an invaluable source. Finally, a word about our book, Greenwich Revealed, published in 2013, our most recent collaboration. Photocopies of the drawings appeared in 2006 and were identified by Neil as Greenwich. He immediately contacted me and our research began. It was enlivened by a most enjoyable train and bus trip to the Wiltshire Record Office, then in Trowbridge to see the original drawings, and then to Wilton House, home of the Earl of Pembroke, the owner of the drawings. Field work on foot <coughs> was crucial, especially in Crews Hill, which is shown in detail on these crude but remarkable circa 1708 drawings. We did a very slow walk up Croons Hill, recording everything in detail, and we were challenged by a man who lived there, wanted to know what we were doing. Neil looked at him and said, we're from the planning department, it's all coming down. <laughs> <laughs> the man was shocked at the <laughs> Sir John Soane Museum, the British Library, Manuscript and Maps Department, and Local Archives Collection. Neil had an eagle eye. He wrote articles about the Pagoda, the Cater Estate, Blackheath Rugby Club, and Joseph Kay. Now, the excellent and very talented John Coulter, who is with us here tonight, and I, as Neil's literary executors, are working through his unpublished drafts <coughs> and notes in order to prepare works for publication. Neil was a good friend, and in many ways a unique historian, dare I say, a phenomenon. So preparing his unfinished works for publication is a very important duty. Huge thanks to Jew, to the Blackheath Society, for all that they are doing to preserve and promote Neil's works. Thank you. Society.
Society has been instrumental in pulling together tonight's event. So I'm pleased to hand over to Paul Watts to talk to you about Neil's role with both the Society and the Blackheath Preservation Trust. Thank you, Roger. Uh, good evening, I'm Paul Watts. I'm the current chair, I'm the 11th chair of the Blackheath Society. Uh, Neil was the fifth chair. Uh, and I'm conscious we are meeting just ahead of England's semi-final against the Netherlands. Uh, so very pleased that we've got a full, a full room this evening and hopefully you'll get home in time at least for extra time and penalties. <laughs> uh, I've therefore only got a, a, quite a short time to attempt to do justice to Neil's huge contribution over many years to these two lo local organisations. Neil devoted 55 years to the society, the Lucky Society, and first became involved, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, when he became press officer in 1969. He was a committee member from 1970 to 88, chair 93 to 98, then vice president, and our president uh, from 2016 uh, until this year. But some things don't change. Um, in researching this, I looked at Guardians of the Heath, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's a history of the society from 1937 to 2008 by Felix Barker and Tony Aldous. And I spotted a reference to the 1997 annual report. The main issues facing the society that year seem to be roads, traffic, and changes to businesses in the village, so, so nothing changes. But also in that annual report, Neil confirmed he would be retiring as chairman and stressed the importance of, of new blood coming to the committee. He said, It is wrong that the society should continue to be governed by a group whose average age qualifies them for state pensions and anticipating the Zimmer frames. <laughs> I suppose I should be glad the state pension age has gone up a bit and we have a, a more representative committee these days. Uh, moving on to the BBT, the Lucky Preservation Trust, Neil started work with the BBT in 1972, along with then Society Chair Bobby Ferber. As we've heard from Julian, um, Roger Martin, who was one of the founders of the Society in 1937, and the BBT in 1938. At about 1972, Roger was ill, and Neil and Bobby were talking to him about taking over the BBT, and they did that, and Roger Martin sadly died in 1974. But the prime objects of the Trust, uh, were to adapt existing buildings to modern uses and to conserve them as amenities in Blackheath and to protect, protect from dilapidation, disfigurement and destruction any buildings in or near Blackheath which are of beauty or historical interest. We've heard earlier about Neil's role and that of the BBT in saving this place, the halls, but the BBT saved many local buildings between 1938 until it was wound up in 2016 when its remaining assets went to the society. We published a book at that time, which many of again, you will have. And there is a PDF copy on our website and some copies downstairs if you haven't seen it. The list of buildings that were saved by Neil and the BPT is long, but as well as the halls, includes Bamborough Castle, Martin House, the Hollies, which is the one featured on the book that is pictured here with Jules Holland and Bobby and Neil at the opening events, Western Woodlands, Lucky Railway Station, Chapman House, Opera Cottage, you've heard, Lucky Darts Club, and Rudin's Chapel. A major contributor to the BBT, and when he retired from the BBT in 2001, there was a, a dinner was held, and there's a tribute, which I found, which uh, attributed to Stephen Norton Pritchard, which says, if Neil didn't exist, it would have been necessary for the well-being of this corner of London to invent him. <laughs> because most visual, tangible elements of the scenery in our area look the way they do today because he saw to it that they were not destroyed. He is not known as Mr. Blackie for nothing. I think that sums up pretty well. In addition to his work with the BBT and the Society, as we've heard and as we set out in our tribute in our spring newsletter, as you've heard from Julia, Neil had a prolific output in terms of writing for various publications researching and writing not only his works, but a huge number of house histories and other material, most of which we hope to include in our archives in the future, but it will be a huge task, as Julian has said. We are, the Society is working with Liz, with the literary executives and others, 
of two unfinished works, the long and eagerly unweighted volume four of Bloody Village Environments, and a third volume of the Walking series, this is about the Walking Western. So watch this space um, for details. Right, um, on your seats, you will have found a, as well as the uh, agenda of the evening, a quiz. Uh, we've been a short quiz to do. Um, Neil was always complaining that people didn't read his books properly. <laughs> and was exasperated when various myths were reported as facts, or when he received inquiries from local residents, or people on the Black Youth Society Committee. Um, he felt they should just buy his books and they could find the answers that, that, that they were looking for. So there were 10 questions. And take care, and Neil's famous sense of humour is evident in some of the questions, and all may not be what they see. You may have picked up some of the answers if you were listening closely to the presentations this evening. I should, however, let you know that these questions were found in Neil's papers, again, in part of an earlier event, but we didn't find the answers. <laughs> so I've spent some time going through his books at the weekend, so we'll see what happens. Uh, if you want to take part, please uh, complete the, the quiz, leave the answers on your chair, or hand them in to one of our uh, committee members, and John Barcher here on the third row is going to be collecting them all in. Uh, we will put the answers, the questions, and eventually the answers and the winner uh, on our website in due course. On the theme of local history myths and, and legends, Neil wrote an excellent article for the Greenwich Society newsletter last September, where he discuss some important misconceptions. I was going to cover a couple of them. For example, the, the so-called captain's houses along Shooters Hill Road, where the claim is that the seven pairs of semi-detached mansions were built for the 14 captains who served with Nelson and Trafalgar. Despite the fact that the Battle of Trafalgar was in 1805, the houses were not built till 1841, so Neil thought that it was unlikely any of the captains were still around or needed accommodation. <laughs> the myth apparently was started by a local crime writer who lived at number 17 in the, in the 50s and 60s, who Neil says admitted it, but that doesn't seem to have stopped his state agents perpetuating that story ever since. <coughs> Another one you may be familiar with, and we've heard of before, he was continuously having to make it clear that um, to clear up any reference to Blackheath as, to, as Blackheath Common. Yeah. Yeah. There was always reminding Peter, people, that Blackheath is not common land. It is at least manorial waste, as I'm sure you all know. That part north of the A2 in, in Greenwich, being part of the, the, the Royal Manor of East Greenwich and Crown Land, and to the south in Lewisham, belonging to the other town. The derivation of, 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 of the word or the name Blackheath was also a popular misunderstanding. And we found also a letter that Neil wrote to the editor of the Times, which I will briefly read to you. 14th of November 2008. Sir, I am sorry the Times is repeating the old camards that Blackheath in South East London took its name because it was a burial ground for victims of the Black Death. The place name appears in the pipe rolls as early as 1166. The so-called Black Death did not occur until 1349, nearly 200 years later. In any event, the remaining local inhabitants would not have spent time and effort dragging putrefying corpses up a hill to bury them in the hard gravel of the people. The term Black Death for that particular plague is comparatively modern, coined by Mrs. Penrose uh, in the early 19th century. Yours, the Aligned, Vice President of the Past Chairman of Blackheath Society. Well said. And I feel I can't complete my, my comments really without mentioning the infamous Tea Hut. <laughs> In his 2002 book, The Heath, he comments on the motor car and illegal parking on the Heath, attracted by the Tea Hut perched quite unlawfully on the edge of the highway and the Heath itself. The Tea Hut, he says, it may have been relatively unobnoxious in the days of horse and cart. It was established in the 1920s, but by the 1970s and 80s, it blighted a sizable corner of the heath. At the time of writing, attempts to remove it are continuing, it says, despite some opposition. The abolition of the GLC in 1986 set back a campaign for 20 years, then at the brink of success. I don't think his views mellowed that much on this subject. 
that uh, you will see for his 80th party, uh, we, we presented him with a cake in the shape of the tea house. <laughs> uh, we took him good, good, uh, good spirit, and we gave him a coffee mug for his 80th birthday, also with the tea house. <laughs> okay, you don't have to just take this from me, we're just going to play, there is a video downstairs, some of you may have seen it on the way in, it will be shown afterwards in the bar as well, put together by Alan Griffin from the committee. I just want to show you a short two minute extract now, uh, just to hear Neil hopefully confirming some of the things I just said. Over to you. Those who haven't read my books who don't know, uh, Blackheath is an ancient name, goes back to the, uh, the 8th century at the very earliest that we know of from record. It has nothing to do with... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the Black Death of 1349. It had enjoyed the name, it enjoyed the word, for at least 500 years before that. And the, the victims of that particular plague were not buried on the heath. Trenching has established no graveyards, no burial mounds. So you can rule that out straight away. It, it is, is not common. This is the other thing. I'll be asking questions about this at the end. So you can <laughs> Blackheath is not common. It is manorial waste. This side of the A2 belongs to the Earl of Dartmouth, who's a chartered accountant who lives in uh, Mayfair somewhere at the moment. And the north side of the A2, towards the park, belongs to Her Majesty the Queen. It's the Royal Manor of East Greenwich, part of. Um, in 1871, Queen Victoria and the then Earl of Dartmouth agreed enthusiastically that care of the heath should be passed to the local authority so the people of London could enjoy it as a place of recreation in perpetuity. Now, the Board of uh, Works was the local authority in 1871. Uh, they eventually became the London County Council and the London County Council became the Greater London Council. Now, one of the worst things Mrs. Thatcher did, and this is not taking party politics anywhere, was she abolished the Greater London Council. And the daft man, Nicholas Ridley, who was her minister at the time, one of the worst, worst parliamentarians who ever walked the earth, decided that the Heath should be split between Greenwich and Lewisham, unlike Hampstead Heath, which went to the City of London as Epic Forest had done. This was a singularly stupid thing to do. Everyone told him of all party persuasions, but he wouldn't be moved. Anyway, he died soon afterwards, and some felt it was a fitting punishment. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Greenwich look after that side of the heath. This side of the heath, the greater portion, probably four-fifths, is looked after by Lewisham, who have deputed the job to a commercial company called Glendale. Um, I'm not sure it's the best thing to do, but at the moment it's not looking too bad. And the changes that you may have seen in the last couple of years... Is <laughs> Follow that. Um, <laughs> please do try and watch the rest of the film if you get a chance to see it. If you don't, we'll, we'll make it available on the, on the website or somewhere, so keep, keep an eye out for that. But in conclusion, um, Neil was an excellent president of the society. He was very keen to be involved and help us with our various activities. And as chair, I became used to regular catch-ups with Neil, usually over a beer or two. And he always had a list of burning issues to discuss, other matters that he felt the society should be dealing with. And he was never short of good ideas. And of course, it's been mentioned already, but the key role that Liz had uh, helping him uh, and being there, supporting and assisting him through those, through those times should, should, should be recorded. Neil made an immense contribution to the Black Heath and Greenwich areas over his career and later years, and his enthusiasm and knowledge of local history was unparalleled. We're fortunate that his memory will long live on in his work and many publications, and his wise counsel, sense of humour, and valuable advice will be us. Thank you. Thank you.
and they'll tell you what they're playing. <laughs>
Jerry super really enjoyed that and uh, quite appropriate for the evening in question. Um, there's a possibility now that somebody might like to come up if they felt they wanted to say a few words, but it would have to be a few words um, in terms of their time with Neil, um, the friendship they have had, maybe something with a degree of humour, um, and there's plenty of them that I could give you, but they, they're not giving me time tonight. Um, so if you're not, if you want to, put your hand up, and we've got five minutes or so on our booking here, but if not, then we'll move it on, and um, it remains for me to thank all of those who have worked so hard behind the scenes for tonight. <laughs>